Then uh, under Section 22.4 of the Act, certain Great Lakes policies um, may be given greater enforceability by declaring them as designated Great Lakes policies in the Source Protection Plan. So again, that hasn't been done yet, but I, I think that's also a, a valuable tool. And um, uh, I'm not clear without returning to the Act from these notes whether that could be done based on wide or whether it would have to be specific to specific planning regions vis-a-vis -vis a particular issue. Um, but either way, you'd want it to end up in a particular planning region at the end of the day if you needed that kind of a, a policy to be designated and, and thus uh, more enforceable. Um, in terms of the greater enforceability, it's, um, it basically makes it akin to a serious threat and therefore uh, the, the measures are mandatory and they also have the benefit of the um, supersedence of other inconsistent uh, tools like planning legislation. So it could be worth doing in certain cases. Um, especially in the case of Great Lakes, if otherwise, without being designated, we may not see Great Lakes threats hitting the thresholds where they're considered um, significant under the way the ministry is doing with any quantitative risk assessment, which is quite possible. So the only other way to have them have those greater, that greater leverage in terms of enforceability would be the, um, the designation tool here. Um, okay, and then uh, the guidance modules themselves for the, uh, the technical work for the, for the threat assessments um, also had some specific provisions. Um, I won't belabor it because we did this other other years, but the zones, the two zones around the Great Lakes intakes, um, a fixed radius zone and then, an, and then a time of travel uh, zone with a provision for taking into account additional influences, um, such as streams, rivers, and land areas that directly feed into the source protection uh, area. Um, and uh, then the ability to consider direct threats like storm, uh, uh, drainage tile areas, storm sewer, watersheds, industrial outfalls, and that kind of thing. Um, okay, so then uh, just to skip ahead in view of the time, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, the fact that, and I had thought that John would be speaking to this at greater length and that I was in danger of duplicating him, but it turns out I'm not. Um, SELA and many other organizations have been advocating a need for much greater integration as a whole vis-a-vis -vis the Great Lakes policies and a number of it under source water protection and a number of other initiatives. We have many things in place. We have the Canada-Ontario Agreement, which was renewed 07 to 2010. That means it's high time to be looking at what the next agreement will look like. Um, in fact, we're getting kind of late in that, although that discussion paper that's just been posted will partially um, speak to that, I presume. Um, it did reference drinking water source protection, watershed-based drinking water source protection in the last renewal. Um, and it's possible that that would be an area, i.e. drinking water, watershed-based source protection, it might be an area for inclusion in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement going forward. Um, in both cases, something that um, is really not happening despite various initiatives over the decades <coughs> is to have watershed planning writ large and then have the drinking water piece of it nest within it. And in the Walkerton report that the Justice O'Connor visit, she did talk about watershed-based drinking water source protection planning, but he didn't imagine it would be just that sitting on its own. You know, he imagined that it would fit within broader watershed resource planning. Uh, so we continue with many others to advocate that that should be the way of the world, and we'd like to start to see some of those provisions in leadership agreements like the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement or, or COA. Um, and then there's the necessity for integration with the Charter Annex uh, water quantity planning and the um, implementing legislation. And this happens on many scales, everything from planning for future water supply for a community where you want to take into account knowing where that might be and doing appropriate source protection so that you don't find out later you caused the problem that you could have prevented 20 years earlier um, and also making sure the water quantity will be sufficient and that you're not hard surfacing the, the, the recharge and all of those kinds of things uh, and that's very poorly integrated right now um, there's hope but it, it isn't happening and that similarly has to integrate with land use planning particularly around issues like places to grow and 
and decisions around where we put in our dense, uh, our dense communities. Um, and then there's the necessity for, in for integrating uh, climate change work under a variety of models and scenarios. Um, climate change was also referenced in the last color renewal and in the Charter Annex and thus in the Charter Annex implementing legislation in Ontario. Um, and uh, referenced is probably the best we can say um, at this point. Uh, so there's probably, a well not probably, there is a necessity to build on that and really flesh that out a lot more. Um, and again, to integrate that with these other initiatives going forward. So that's a pretty um, fast overview, I realize, but I understand uh, the agenda is pretty tight.